Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for October 28th, 2019. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Trends in Global Privacy, GDPR One Year Later with Scott Russell. Scott is a senior policy analyst at Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research and is a member of Trusted CI. Scott presented on the topic of GDPR in May 2018, and he has returned to tell us what's happened since then and to prepare us for upcoming legislation in the U.S. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during this uh, during the session using the chat box. Uh, if you click on the chat icon, a little box will pop up. And uh, we, will have, we will hopefully have time at the end of presentation to take questions. Uh, but you're encouraged to uh, ask questions during, during it as well. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Scott. Scott, welcome. Thanks, Jen. You sound good. Awesome. All right, so yes, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I am Scott Russell. I'm a senior policy analyst at the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research at Indiana University. Uh, I also do a lot of work with Trusted CI, as you heard. And uh, today I'm going to be giving a follow-up talk to one I gave last year, uh, talking about the, at the time, new uh, European Union's uh, General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR for short, it was a, a big privacy law that came out. And at the time, a lot of people were really nervous about it. And so I, uh, I put together some basic information just to try to help people understand what's going on with that. And, uh, you know, kind of like quell the fears a little bit. And uh, this, is ba this talk is going to be uh, a little bit of a fusion of a couple of different things. So uh, first... I'm going to give just a quick recap, just for people who maybe didn't see my previous talk. Uh, it's available online, but uh, just quickly, you know, one minute version of like what, what I was saying about GDPR. And uh, then I'll give you some overview of the stuff that's happened since GDPR came out. As I think a lot of us understand, a law will be passed, but we don't really know what it means until there's been some time for like courts to deliberate and to actually see what like the, uh, the people who enforce the law are doing with it. So the first section, I'm gonna be talking primarily about that. Um, the second section, I'm gonna kinda go a little bit broader. We're gonna get out of the EU and uh, see some of the other privacy laws that are uh, popping up around the globe. Uh, most of them are, because GDPR was such a, a huge uh, sort of, it was, a, it was a global event in the privacy world there's been a lot of sort of repercussions and most of these new laws are often contextualized uh, with GDPR in mind. So they're either said, you know, this is Brazil's GDPR or this is the GDPR of the US. So I'm gonna give a little bit of detail about what's going on there and point out just any big differences and kind of try and help you figure out how much you should care. And then this third section is the most nebulous. This is, uh, me trying to do probably too much in one talk, which is talking just some big picture thoughts about uh, the international privacy scene right now, kind of like what's going on, why are things happening this way, and kind of how you should think about it. Um, because this is kind of like three mini talks that I'm cramming together, uh, I'm, I'm very open to uh, questions. I'm gonna kind of try and take a little bit of a pause between each of these three sections because they're a little disjointed. So if you have questions after one, uh, I'm gonna try and answer those there. And then also we'll leave time at the end for broader questions. And in particular, I just wanna point out that um, this third section, the international privacy, the big picture thoughts, I'm most interested in people's thoughts uh, because obviously a lot of people have thoughts about privacy and they're very wide ranging. And I think those are really good topics for discussion. And so I might be able to give you some context there. Okay, so starting things off, just reminding people, what was GDPR? So just the quick facts, it was Europe's big privacy law, right? This is the one, it, uh, it came out about two years ago. And uh, why do people care? Because it went outside of Europe. That was the big thing. You know, people said, you know, this is Europe. 
regulating the whole world because GDPR can apply anywhere. Or that's what Europe said. Uh, in addition, they had these ridiculously high fines that were possible. So the uh, the numbers thrown around were uh, either two percent or four percent of uh, uh, total revenues, which is basically like it's not profits. You know, it's it's literally how much money your business just makes overall, and you can get four percent of that. And since these laws were, I mean, this law in particular was targeted at the uh, the Googles and the Facebooks and the sort of big tech platforms, we're talking about billions of dollars. And so uh, those two things alone got a lot of people's attention. Uh, this third bullet is uh, a little cheeky, but it's basically, you know, what were the things that I was complaining about when I first looked at this law? So one, there was obviously the uh, the extraterritorial scope. Extraterritorial just means outside of your territory. So when Europe regulates or tries to regulate people in the U.S., that's extraterritorial. I'm going to use that word a lot. I apologize. It's, it's the law background. Uh, but also there were these problems of vagueness and overbreath. Overbreath is is maybe going a little bit too far, but definitely vagueness and broadness, where. GDPR was trying to do these really big, important things, but in order to do them, it couldn't be very specific about how it wanted things to be done. And so people looked at this law and it would say things like, you know, you need to impl you know, implement uh, data protection by design. And everyone said, ooh, that sounds really good. What does that mean? And if you try to figure out what that means, it's kind of, it comes up empty. So those types of things bugged me. Because when you have these enormous fines on the line, if you don't know what you need to do to meet the law's requirements, that's really scary. And then the sort of question of like, how big of an impact has GDPR had on our privacy? And that's just really hard to tell. I'm a little bit skeptical that it's, it's just fixed all of our problems. I think mostly it's created a lot of you know, regulatory overhead, but most companies are still kind of doing the same stuff they were doing before. Also, I apologize. There's apparently lawn work going on outside my office. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything I can do about that right now. I can't hear it right now, so so keep going. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so what were the big changes of GDPR? This was this is recapping a little bit of what I talked in my previous talk. The big shift was it goes to an illegal unless specifically legal model, which basically means in the U.S. as a default, we assume. You can do data processing and data collection unless there is a law that tells you you can't. GDPR swaps it around and says you can't do it unless there is a provision in GDPR that specifically says you can. So that's like a, that's a sea change, you know, a paradigm shift in the way that we think about privacy law. Uh, second big change, it does a lot of burden shifting over to what they call you know, data controllers and data processors. These are basically the companies. Whereas like uh, we individuals would be data subjects, we're the people that data is about. Data controllers and processors, you know, data controllers control the data, data processors process it. The distinction can be a little muddy, but it's basically we're thinking when there is a dispute, the burden falls on the corporations to prove that they are right rather than on us to prove that they are wrong. Um, the third one is this trend towards establishing data subject rights. And as I say, there are a whole lot of rights. It's, it's a little bit ridiculous when you just try it. Yeah, like I can't even articulate them off the top of my head. It took up two slides and a little more. And uh, the fourth point was uh, this, this broad scope, where basically we're concerned that if we write narrowly tailored laws, that they're really easy for technologies to be created, that will just kind of circumvent them. And so to avoid that, you just go broad. Okay, so that's my quick overview of kind of like what the uh, what GDPR was like at the time. All right, now we're gonna talk about what's happened since. And when we're thinking about that, I alluded to this earlier, but what are the three big categories of things that we're probably gonna pay the most attention to? Uh, the first one, which is the biggest in my mind, is uh, the C CJEU, I call it the CJU, uh, it's the, uh, the Court of Justice for the European Union. It's the top your EU court. And uh, you can think of it kind of like the US Supreme Court uh, because uh, its decisions apply across the EU. There is no court of further appeal from it. And it only accepts a very small number of cases. So again, a lot of parallels to our Supreme Court. Uh, the second 
but of course, because like I said, uh, there are a small number of cases, and so we don't get a whole lot out of them. Uh, the second one is lower court cases. This probably should all make sense. There are more of them, but there aren't as meaningful because they could be overturned, right? You know, people can appeal lower court decisions, go up to the high court, and the high court can disagree. So these are interesting, uh, particularly if there are like a lot of lower court cases that all kind of agree, because a lot of times that's a good indicator. You know, agreement or disagreement at the lower levels is a good indicator of what the uh, top courts are gonna do. But they're ultimately just less impactful because we're, the companies we're dealing with in general, if they get a decision they don't like, they're probably gonna appeal it. And uh, the third one is these member state enforcement actions. So if you'll remember, uh, you know, GDPR set a standard for all of the EU, but each member state, which is just the countries in the EU, have a local sort of like data protection authority. And that, that's sort of like their FTC, or, um, you know, it's, it's like a, they, they're the ones who will go around and actually do the fining, like the, at the lowest level. And so these are interesting because this gives us the best sense of how the law is actually being applied, as opposed to like what the law means in a sort of abstract legal sense. This is, is really concrete. You know, it's like if they're going around and all of their enforcement actions are based on data breaches, that's really useful to know. Okay. So just some general updates. What has happened you know, in the year and a half since the law came out? Um, so first, only 28% of companies claim that they are compliant. And that's, you know, this is the companies claiming they're compliant. This isn't like a third party who assessed them. So I think it's fair to say the number is much, much lower than this. Um, I mean, there are a lot of estimates about you know, how is compliance going with this. They're all very low. And honestly, I think if we were saying who, how compliant are companies in an absolute sense, I think you could make a pretty good case that really no one is compliant 100%. You know, people are trying and they're working on it, but the law is just so big and it's so unclear that as we'll see, you know, it's really easy to get dinged on stuff that you didn't even realize was a problem. All right, second big uh, general update is that there's just a lot of litigation going on right now. Uh, lawsuits take time. Uh, especially in sort of big bureaucracies, which the EU is definitely one of. And so, you know, we'll, we see these court cases that'll come out, but it'll be like a lower court decision and then they're, they're maybe appealing to the top court and that's just, you know, they have to do the arguments. It, it takes a very long time. So we don't have a whole lot of very clear final answers yet, but there's, there's a pretty good sense of like where the issues are right now. Uh, the caseloads are very heavy. So the estimate I've seen thrown around, I think this was from the one-year mark, was uh, 280,000 complaints. And complaints, those are uh, like uh, data subject complaints. So that'd be like you or me, we send in something to our data protection authority saying, you know, I'm mad about XYZ website because they're not following the law. Um, there have been a huge number of data breach notifications. This has been, I think, probably the biggest impact of the law is that we're just seeing, you know, 90,000 basically data breach notifications, which is a lot. And uh, one of the other things we noted was that the early fines were kind of small, right? They threw around this big number, you know, 4% of uh, global annual turnover. But when you actually looked at the fines that were being levied, they, they weren't that much. But some of that changed more recently. So, these are kind of like the three big ticket ones that I have seen. The largest fine that's happened thus far was to British Airways for 183 million. I believe that is British pounds. Sorry, I use the currency symbols, but um, I'm not that great with them. And so uh, what they'll note here is this was 1.5% of global annual turnover. So it's not the, they haven't used the maximum penalty possible, but it's a pretty big fine. And uh, why did they do this? Well, it was basically a security breach. You know, there were 500,000 records that were, uh, that were released. There was, um, I think it was malware in an ad, uh, like the, the ads that they used on the, uh, the British Airways uh, website was redirecting people and it was stealing credit cards and the like. And so the cause that was listed here was just poor security arrangements. And, uh, Obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole GDPR again, but one of the things that's notable about GDPR is that it basically has like one provision about security 
and it says that you need to do adequate security. And it gives you a couple of very like vague, uh, well not vague, but not very helpful like requirements where it says like you should encrypt data at rest, which, and it gives you like four examples kind of at that level of complexity. So it's really not a security law. It's not a cybersecurity law at its core. It's a privacy law, but it put, but almost all privacy laws have these kind of security clauses in them. And so when I look at something like this and it's like, wow, this is, we're talking about like, you know, $200 million because they, you know, didn't comply with a, a paragraph and the paragraph did not stay like, this is how you do good security. It just says do good security. And if it's wrong, we'll tell you with a big fine. So that kind of stuff, you know, that kind of scares me a little bit because it seems like, you know, if the privacy law should be mostly concerned with, you know, the privacy stuff. I mean, obviously security and privacy go hand in hand, but considering the lack of specificity, the size of this fine was, was notable to me. And uh, this is going to be a little bit of a theme because the second biggest one, which was Marriott International, you know, it's a hotel chain, same thing. Uh, there was just a data breach. Uh, this one was a little bit different. It happened because of a corporate takeover. So this happens a lot in hotels where um, you kind of, you know, you acquire another hotel or hotel chain and they just use different systems than you. And it makes it really difficult to have a single cohesive, like this is how we do things. You end up kind of having like, like a web of, you know, all of the different ways we handle X issue. And so this one, they basically acquired a data breach and, uh, and in doing so incurred a $100 million fine. So again, this is basically, you know, it's a security thing and it's stemming from that one paragraph. And uh, the third big one was a Google opinion where um, People were complaining about how uh, Google presents their information and this one. So they were the concern around here was a little bit of it was a little bit around forced consent, which I'm going to talk more about later. But mostly it was saying, look, the GDPR has a whole bunch of requirements about the, uh, the information you have to make available to users. Right. You have to say, like, what data we collect, how long we store it, who we transfer it to, all this kind of stuff. And it basically said, all right, well, Google, you're kind of making that information available, but it's not available in like the most like convenient way. And uh, because of that, because of the way you've like presented the information, we think it's not good enough. And so they, you know, they hit them with this $50 million fine or 50 million euro fine. And this is another one that I was, I looked at and I was like, that's, it seems like a lot, especially since, and the opinion, they kind of like tacitly acknowledge that Google is doing all the right stuff. They're just not really doing it in the right ways. So you would think that they would, you know, maybe take a more measured approach. But this is another one of the, uh, the big opinions. And this one is, is, of course, being appealed. So it's not finalized yet. Okay, so moving away from just the fines, um, these are just some other um, relatively big court opinions that have happened uh, in the interim. So this one, ICANN versus EPAG, uh, the, the details of this one are a little bit complicated, but if you think of like ICANN, it does, you know, domain name registration. So this, we're talking about like, you know, new website, you're trying to like getting a new domain name. ICANN is uh, US based, uh, EPAG is their like German counterpart. And so ICANN says, all right, well, new people are registering domain names. Uh, we, we ask them for some information. So we say, okay, who is the registrant? Then they also ask for an administrative contact and a technical contact. And uh, their, uh, you know, EPAG, the, the German equivalent, said, um, uh, I don't think we can actually collect the, uh, you know, the administrative contract and the technical contract under GDPR, right? Because there is a clause that says um, that if we're going to collect data, it has to be necessary. This is one of those lawful... Uh, on those lawful uses that you have to point to. And they said, um, well, if we're pointing to this necessary one, it has to be really necessary. And we don't think that the administrative contact and the technical contact are necessary. They might be really useful, but we don't think they're necessary. So they went to the court and uh, court agreed that um, these, you know, these, the administrative contact and the technical contact aren't necessary. 
And because of that, uh, it's not lawful to rely on uh, those, you know, that clause. So the takeaway, I, I mean, when I looked at this, there were some pe people who are familiar with um, like ICANN and some of these more like uh, weedsy uh, internet, you know, processes looked at this and were like, whoa, that's, that's weird because the information that you get from this is a lot of times really useful um, for security purposes. Um, but I looked at this and ultimately just said, you know, when GDPR says necessary, they really mean necessary, right? They're not given a whole lot of leeway on this. And I put this kind of caveat down at the bottom, which is, was in the opinion, and I'm not totally sure how to, um, how to think about this. So um, the European Data Protection Board just emphasized that, you know, existing measures uh, should be taken into account when considering how you enforce GDPR which is kind of their way of saying like, look, we know this law is um, uh, really complex and potentially onerous, but we're gonna try and give you credit where credit's due and we'll take all that into account when we're maybe like talking about, you know, what, um, what remedies we're gonna do. Like, are we gonna fine you or are we just gonna say like, no, you should do it this way instead of that way. Okay, a couple other uh, quick legal decisions. Uh, this first one, Facebook and Facebook uh, fan page administrators are uh, both responsible. So this case was about cookie tracking. And uh, one, you know, one of the many things GDPR requires is that they're supposed to tell people about cookie tracking and you're supposed to get consent and stuff like that. And uh, what they tried to say was, what well, the Facebook fan page admins basically tried to say was like, this is, this is Facebook's job. This isn't our job, right? We're just a fan page. And uh, this, you know, the CJU, the, the highest court, said, um, nope, you guys are jointly responsible. You know, we can kind of like, maybe like how, uh, how much responsibility falls on each party can vary a little bit, but you can't just offload it completely. Um, I highlight this as a big deal because one of my immediate reactions when I saw this law was that if you, the more you can compartmentalize your business or organization, the easier it'll be to potentially deal with this. If you just say, okay, I am a company in the US and I'm concerned about this EU privacy law. Why don't I just have a partner in the EU? And I say, all right, EU partner, you deal with all the GDPR stuff. And, uh, and then we, we just interact in our normal way. And that way I don't actually have to worry about the law. And this opinion kind of put the kibosh on that. And it said, look, just because, you know, just because you're kind of further away doesn't mean that you're not actually a controller or a processor, that you're not like directing the, uh, the collection of cookies in this case. And so you can't just kind of hide behind like a shell company or even like just a legitimate partner in the EU. Because like if Facebook is far away, but they're the reason that data is being collected, then you are still a controller for GDPR's purposes. So I, I wasn't thrilled about that opinion, but it's definitely good to know. Um, this next one, uh, it, I think most people probably could have guessed this, but it basically says that religious groups have to follow GDPR too. So this case was, um, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses who um, would go door to door and would basically take like handwritten notes about their interactions with people, you know, they're, and, uh, the, you know, again, they said, oh yeah, that's covered, you know, even though it's handwritten notes, um, you guys still have to follow GDPR and all of the, the many provisions. And uh, the third one I just mentioned here, which I thought was funny at the time, which was that uh, Max Schrems, who has sort of made his name, uh, you know, litigating against Facebook in the EU, uh, is suing again. And um, actually, what was it, Facebook or Google? But um, basically the day the law went active, he filed complaints in four different countries. I think it was Google, against Google actually, but, um, and this one was arguing about forced consent. So backing up a little bit, if we remember, I said that there are these lawful processing types. One of those is always consent. You know, consent is like the classic privacy law test. You know, if the person consented, it's probably okay. And another one is legitimate use. And the difference between those is legitimate use is something where you don't need consent because basically it's our way of saying, no, the thing you're doing just makes sense. You know, it's something that companies probably need to do 
and we don't need to force you to get consent on that because we're going to let you do it. And um, Schrems was basically arguing that the, uh, the way you break apart what you can consent to and what is just legitimate use um, is important. That there are, I should be able to not consent to specific things and not have those specific things happen, but still have the rest of what your you know, company does be allowed rather than making this kind of like a package deal where you have to consent to all of it or nothing. Uh, he wanted a little bit more of a break apart. At least that was my understanding of it. Um, okay, I need to start going faster. Okay, so this was, uh, the Planet 49 case was just about cookies. And uh, basically it said, um, we've all seen these kind of banner ads, I think, where up at the bottom it says, by the way, you know, we, you know, we track cookies. And this case basically said, is it okay to just have a uh, pre-checked uh, checkbox that says, you know, by continuing to use this website, you agree, as opposed to requiring them to, you know, affirmatively act. So they actually have to go down and click, yeah, you know, click the little checkbox that says, I do agree, then hit okay. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a weedsy detail, but I think what the, uh, the commentary about this mostly says that people were giving lip service to some of this notice and consent stuff, where they were basically doing the same thing they always did, but they gave a little notice at the bottom that said, by the way, we collect cookies, rather than actually giving people a chance to consent. And so uh, this case kind of like slapped that down and said, no, you have to give people a real choice. It also uh, mentioned some other requirements, like you have to tell people how long you store the cookies, who you share them with, et cetera. And uh, I just, I thought it was funny that uh, the day that opinion came out, uh, people noted that the EU court's own website wasn't compliant with uh, the requirements that they said in that opinion. Okay, and I think this is the last of the court case updates, or uh, this is kind of two. So this is about the right to be forgotten. I thought this case was just interesting. So if people remember the right to be forgotten, it actually predated GDPR a little bit, but it basically said that under certain circumstances, people can petition to the Googles or you know, the search engines of the world and say, I want you to remove private information about me from your search engine. You're not actually taking it off the internet. It's just not indexed in the search engine. And uh, this was very controversial in the US because it goes against a lot of the ways we think about sort of like free speech and rights to access to information. But in the EU, it, you know, they're, cultural differences that kind of explain this. This case was just an, an extreme example of that, where a convicted felon, uh, uh, you know, where his crime was homicide, you know, he was in jail for 10 plus years, wanted to have uh, the news articles about uh, his conviction uh, removed from Google searches. And Google argued like, wait, no, this, no, this is clearly in the public interest. The public has a right to know. And so they appealed it to Finland's Supreme Court and uh, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the convict and said, well, even though this person was convicted of murder, it was, uh, murder is technically not the correct term here because in Finnish law, murder is a more extreme sentence, but um, they were convicted of, you know, diminished response. It was a homicide with diminished responsibility, which is sort of like the, uh, I don't know, the younger brother of an, of an insanity defense. Like insanity, people normally say, you know, if you were insane, we're not going to, you know, convict you of the crime. We'll, we'll probably institutionalize you or something, but, you know, you can't be convicted of murder if you were insane. Diminished responsibility, you can still be convicted, but it's generally a lesser sentence. So that's what happened here. And uh, the court basically said that uh, the information about their diminished responsibility um, could have like severe psychological impacts on the person's uh, you know, mental health and had, it raised arguments like that. And uh, because of that, they, they cited against Google and said, no, you have to take this information out. And I just note here at the bottom, this one's a little complicated because, uh, you know, Finland has their own privacy laws in addition to GDPR. And so sussing out which one is actually being talked about can be a little tricky. And then the other big update was um, that in France, they, uh, on the right to be forgotten, uh, they tried to argue that uh, when we win a right to be forgotten case, you have to take it down for the entire world. And Google said, no, we're, we're only taking it down inside the, you know, your jurisdiction, basically. And so they appealed that up to the, uh, you know, the Court of Justice and in that case, they agreed with them. 
they said, you know, you only have to remove search results in the EU, which means that we in the US can still uh, read those websites, you know, those news stories. Uh, it's just in the EU that they can. Okay, so my big kind of takeaways from here is number one, a lot of it seems like GDPR is kind of acting like a big data breach law. Right? A lot of the big cases are about data breaches. I, mean, I think that kind of makes sense because that's something that people naturally care about. And uh, it's also, you know, relatively easy to identify, whereas some of these other, you know, if you're not compliant with some of the technical provisions of the law, that can be kind of difficult to, um, to uh, suss out. Um, there's limited to no enforcement of some of the most vague provisions. So some of the stuff that I was complaining about when this law came out, I think it's still complaint worthy, but there, we're just not seeing a whole lot of like, you know, litigation on those claims because no one's bringing the data minimization, I mean, data protection by design argument, you know, against Google. There's easier stuff to win first. And the third point is just that um, the machinery for this is still ramping up. Like I mentioned, there's a ton of cases, you know, there were a ton of complaints, you know, 280,000. And uh, the data protection authorities, you know, it's, it's ultimately just people. And they had to bring on a whole lot of new people to start dealing with the law. And they're still kind of ramping up. You know, they're training people. Everyone's still kind of learning how to bring these cases. Um, and uh, just one, I don't actually have this on, on my notes here. But um, one of the uh, things we've also noticed is that um, when you kind of look at, like, what parts of the law are getting the most use from, like, the data subjects, it's mostly access requests, right? It's people who want to know what information is being collected about me. That's the, that's the thing that people primarily care about. And then sort of secondarily, there will be things like deletion. And so just keeping that in mind when you're kind of prioritizing, uh, letting people know, you know, what data is collected is probably the thing, is like the most important uh, individual provision of the law. Okay, I'll pause for a second if anyone has questions on that. Sorry, that took longer than I was hoping. Well, I'll ask a question just to give people time to type. Uh, you kind of talked about how some of these decisions, they're, because they're so new, the courts are kind of almost like walking back or uh, acknowledging that there's some flawed definitions. Uh, can Google or Marriott or whoever just renegotiate the settlement that they have to pay as well? Or are they, have the checks been cut? Um, well, that's a, that's a good question. I'm not sure exactly how that would sort of work at a procedural level. I think for most of these, um, the primary way that they, they renegotiate is by winning the litigation. And so they really want to get a court to agree with them that you know, in some way, the, the thing that the data protection authority did was not right. And that gives them, you know, grounds for renegotiation. Um, so I, can, at any time, I suppose they could like uh, spontaneously renegotiate, you know, sort of like settle. Okay. But I wouldn't expect that. I think at this point, there's definitely kind of a push to let's figure out what this thing actually means. So th you're, you're going to get people, uh, appealing it like automatically is what you're saying. Yeah, I think okay. so. Oh, it looks like we got a couple of questions here if you want to read them off. Um, okay, so quest the first question is, what is your current thinking about risks of GDPR fines against US universities that host NSF funded research projects? Any examples of this? Okay, this is a, this is a good question. And it's something I meant to, uh, I had in my notes, my speaker notes somewhere, but I as I talk, I can never read what, I'm, what I wrote. Um, I have not seen any higher profile cases of um, enforcement actions being taken outside of the EU. So there hasn't been a, the really high profile like US based company that doesn't have any like footprint in the EU um, having uh, like a data protection authority kind of go after them. Not that I've seen. So as for the actual risks of GDPR fines, I mean, I, st I think they're pretty low. Um, it's not non-existent, obviously it kind of depends on what you're doing. Uh, the more contact you have, you know, the more like sort of like contacts you have with, uh, with the EU, like if you have lots of EU students, if you have maybe like, uh, if you have, you know, research collaborations or, or whatever else, that those all kind of increase the risk 
but in general, it seems pretty low. And I think another way of thinking about this is almost all of these complaints are starting from like actual complaints by data subjects. So it'd be like, you know, you or me, um, we have a problem and we raise it with a data protection authority in one of these, you know, EU member states. And so you can always kind of contextualize the law in terms of like, well, what are people actually going to be complaining about? And is it something that I'm doing? And so there's, there's a reason why a lot of the, you know, apart from like data breaches, which are always going to be a problem, a lot of the sort of like, um, you know, the sort of technical non-compliance complaints are being levied against like the Googles and the Facebooks, these sort of big companies that people are almost inherently skeptical of what they're doing. And I don't think universities fall into that category. Um, okay. All right. Two more questions. Yep. I'll, I'll just go through them quickly and then I'll, I'll move on. Um, it says, uh, BA is certainly at the intent to fine stage. So BA can, I assume BA is British Airways in this case. This was the, uh, the first big fine. And yeah, and so they can and are making a uh, representation that the amount is excessive. Yeah, I, I agree. I think they're probably going to push back on the size of that fine. And, and um, th there's also always kind of a, there's always the desire on the point on the part of like the regulator to, you know, kind of come out of the gate swinging a little bit. And so, you know, sometimes there is someone who gets, they're kind of like held up as the sacrificial lamb. And it's pretty easy to push back against that by saying like, oh, come on, this is, this is too much. Um, and there's a question, are the collective fines earmarked for any particular purpose? That is a really good question. And I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I'm not, I don't think so, but um, I, I don't know exactly how the funds are used. Sorry. All right, so uh, moving on quickly to uh, some of the GDPR cap copycat laws. And of course, the first uh, GDPR copycat is actually, again, in the EU. This is one of these things that this, this confused me for a long time because there's always, I mean, prior to GDPR, there was this thing called the Data Protection Directive, which is very similar to GDPR in, in sort of like goals, where it's, it's the generalized data protection, right? It applies to everything, sets like the ground rules. And, but there was also this thing called the e-privacy directive. And I was like, wait, what? Why are there two laws doing the same thing? Well, it turns out that um, if you think about uh, GDPR or, and the, DD, you know, the data protection directive, these are the ground rules, but then they have a couple of laws that are more specific. E-privacy is one of these, where it kind of gives you more details on a more narrow category of data. So this one is primarily concerned with communications. And uh, you'll notice in my, in my notes that there's been this ongoing discussion of like, do we really need another big privacy law in the EU? Like people are still trying to figure out GDPR. Why are we throwing more complexity and more law into this? But this has been in the works for a while and it hasn't been like officially renounced or anything. People still think this is probably coming soon. And so basically, it's more specific rules regarding uh, how you should handle communications. So it's you know, it's ranging from stuff like how do we handle the content of communications uh, down to like how do we handle the metadata, like all the stuff, you know, like the, the to, the from, uh, the time, that kind of stuff. And uh, some of the motivations here, obviously uh, the second one is exactly the same as GDPR. Uh, directives are uh, member state by member state, like everyone kind of writes their own rules whereas a regulation applies across the board. So this basically just unifies the system. It also is a good chance to just enforce stronger rules. And uh, the other big motivation is that basically every app now, when you, if we think about the, you know, the internet is basically apps, kind of. Um, everything has a communications functionality built into it, right? You know, you're on Instagram, which is, you know, mostly about you know, like looking at pictures of food and whatnot but it has a chat function in there. You know, Facebook has a chat function, you know, gaming apps have chat functions and I'm like, everything has communications built in. And so this is kind of trying to address that. Uh, I'm not really sure, just thinking more big picture, like how to think about e-privacy. Um, the previous, uh, you know, the e-privacy directive was frequently criticized as being kind of like a paper tiger 
and they said that you know the only people who you know basically it was never really enforced no one ever really knew what it meant and so it's not clear if this new one is going to be uh, more clear and more concrete and uh, and how it's going to interplay with gdpr okay uh, but on to the actual uh, GDPR copycats. Uh, the big one that most people probably care about is the California Consumer Protection Act. Uh, it's been sort of branded as America's GDPR. I don't think that's actually correct. It's definitely less burdensome. When I read through it, I wasn't as uh, sort of like, you know, fuming in my chair as I was when I was reading GDPR. Uh, it, has its, it has problems, but I'm, they're not on the same scale as GDPR is in my mind. Um, I have this sort of you know, question here, like why don't I, why didn't I just focus on this law? Because this one is, has a lot of people interested because California is the big you know, market in the US. California is often the de facto regulator of the whole country, right? If California passes a law, often everyone else, you know, all the big companies, if you wanna do business in California, you might as well just make that your, uh, your you know, uh, nationwide standard because it's just harder to have state by state requirements. Uh, but so re reason, some reasons why I didn't give it its own talk. One, uh, it explicitly doesn't cover uh, uh, anyone who is not a for-profit entity. So uh, universities, um, apart from maybe, I guess, for-profit universities, but you know, scientists, researchers, probably this is not going to apply to you. This is primarily targeted at businesses. So that's one of the reasons since, you know, trusted CI were often primarily concerned with how these things are going to impact the science community and it just looks like ccpa is just not going to all right so just some other basic details about it um, when does the law actually come online pretty soon it's uh january this coming january of 2020. um there's some technical details where uh, it might not actually be enforceable until closer to july Basically, they said, um, well, you can't really start enforcing the law until the Attorney General of California comes out with some regulations telling you what the law actually means. Those are in the process, right? Those are in the works right now. But until those are finalized, there's going to be like a six month grace period to actually give people a chance to try to, you know, make sure that they're compliant rather than just have a law that just hits, you know, the day it's finished writing and people are, you know, caught with their pants down. And um, something I've just heard about recently is that people are already talking about like a CCPA 2.0, right? The first law isn't even out yet. And people are already talking about how we can improve it, expand it, change it. I'm not really sure where all these discussions are going, but just highlighting that this is not going to be like a one and done area, that this is probably something that's going to be kind of a, a moving target for a while. Okay, so who's actually affected by um, CCPA? I alluded to this earlier, but it's only for-profit seeking entities uh, doing business in California. And uh, you have to fit one of these uh, three additional requirements. You either have to, you know, gross revenue is over 25 million. So you have to be kind of big. That's one way to get, you know, have it regulate you. One is if you are, you know, basically buying, selling, sharing, receiving uh, information on over 500, I mean, 50,000 uh, California consumers. Uh, so basically, if you're if you're ma managing data about a lot of California people, even if you don't fit that uh, 25 million uh, revenue cap, you can still be covered. And then the third is um, if you derive 50% or more of your annual revenue from selling California consumers data. So even if you're a small business, if you're really just in the business of uh, you know selling or processing consumer data, then you're still covered. And uh, we look at who is protected. It's uh, focused at consumers, uh, but it's kind of defined broadly. So people think employees are probably covered too. Uh, only those in California. So I live in Indiana. I would not be a California consumer. I would not necessarily get these rights. Um, but since there's, there's an assumption that when this comes online, people who have to comply with it will probably just make you know, whatever, whatever things they offer to California, they'll probably offer everywhere else. Maybe not, but that's the way people tend to think about it. And uh, lots of details are going to come in the regulations. They create a bunch of rights. Um, since I'm running out of time, I'm going to skim through these. Most of these are pretty common for, uh, for privacy laws. Uh, we see like uh, transparency, access, deletion kind of stuff. We see it in like the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which has been around for you know, 30 plus years. Um, the difference is that this applies to all data, whereas other, you know, privacy laws in the U.S. would really say, like, 
No, it has to be like information that meets a certain like importance, you know, like credit reporting data is very important because it you know, determines whether or not you can get a loan and stuff like that. But this just applies to any data. So you have rights of access and deletion. Um, there's some weird ones as well. Like they're supposed to tell you how valuable your personal data is to them. I have no idea how this is going to work in practice. There are people who have been talking about like rewards programs with like grocery stores where they're supposed to tell you, I mean, they give you some sense of like, you know, here's how much we value the fact that we know you buy milk every Tuesday or something like that. And there's also this, uh, probably the most important, there's a right to opt out of uh, sale of your personal information to third parties. Uh, all right. Primarily, it's going to be enforced by the California Attorney General, but there is a private right of action for unencrypted data breaches. So this is something relatively new, which means that like uh, private right of action just means like you or me, just like a regular consumer, can uh, can sue in court on this very narrow case of if there was a data breach and the data that was um, released was unencrypted. All right. So a couple other GDPR copycats um, in Brazil. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that. We're going to call it LGPD. It is very widely seen as just a GDPR copycat. You know, it has extraterritorial application, which means even though the law is in Brazil, it applies to anyone anywhere as long as they um, have sufficient uh, contacts with Brazil. Uh, it's very focused on giving data subjects rights. So you can think of it as similar to GDPR, where it had the laundry list of rights or CCPA, which had the, uh, the much smaller, but still not insignificant list of rights. Uh, it's a, you know, does this paradigm shift where it, um, you know, data processing and collection is illegal unless specifically legal. Although um, an interesting thing here is that Brazil is offering more lawful bases for processing than uh, GDPR did. GDPR had only six that you could point to. Uh, Brazil, I think, has 10. And uh, so people, when they look at those, that's you know, kind of like, okay, we've got more tools to work with when we're trying to figure out how can we keep sort of conducting our business. Uh, this one's coming online in February. Uh, as to how much people should actually care about this, it's a little bit less clear. I mean, there's always sort of a, uh, geopolitics not the right word, but just thinking about sort of like the size of the economy tends to uh, dictate how much we care about these laws when it comes to extraterritorial application. So the EU, enormous economy, right? Uh, we care a lot about you know, the fact that if the EU is trying to regulate us and we want access to the EU, that's a big deal. Brazil, also a big economy, not as big, but definitely big. But I don't know how common it is for people to be interacting with Brazil as compared to say the EU, but I'm guessing it's, you know, Pretty significantly less. I include it on here just because it is a very big economy and so this is one that will probably have impact on at least some, maybe some people in the audience right now. And uh, the other big uh, act that I'm calling out is uh, Japan's Act on the Protection of Personal Information. Uh, this isn't a whole new law but rather they've made some kind of tweaks that make it more, you know, give it more of a GDPR uh, twinge. So one, they updated to include extraterritorial application. So even, you know, Japan is getting on the train of our laws apply everywhere. And uh, the other thing that's of noteworthy here is that they've included a sort of, well, they basically they've come to like a reciprocity agreement with the EU. And this kind of just means that um, EU and J the EU and Japan both kind of agree that, okay, those other guys, their laws are pretty good too. We agree to enforce their laws if they agree to enforce ours. So like if you were an EU person in the EU and uh, you've got a complaint against a Japanese company, this agrees that you will actually have like a mechanism for that. Whereas right now, if you are, if they were, if there's like an EU person in the EU and they've got a complaint about a US company, the US can just say, you know, you, you don't have jurisdiction over us. You know, we don't have to follow this law. So um, this reciprocity agreements are, not unheard of in uh, the privacy space. It's one of the ways we kind of deal with the, uh, a global economy and different, you know, everyone has kind of their own spin on privacy laws. These are kind of make it a little bit easier for those to work together. And there's, there's obviously a bunch more. Uh, South Korea has often raised, I mean, they've had longstanding strong privacy laws, but that's another one that's 
being kind of like updated to be more GDPR-ish. And there's probably going to be more of these uh, coming down the down the pipeline as as people trying to kind of try and figure out you know what do privacy laws look like, what is working, and write their own. So um, I'll pause again if anyone has any questions about any of the uh, GDPR copycats. All right, in, in case anyone's typing, I'll, I'll, I'll give a brief overview of this last section with the, uh, I guess, eight minutes I have left. Also, if anyone has any just generalized questions as well, I've run into what I was hoping would just be question time. So feel free to uh, throw questions about anything in there too. Uh, okay, so we got one question. Does Canada have anything similar? You know, I haven't seen anything talking about a, uh, a Canadian GDPR. Canada definitely has privacy laws, but I'm not sure if they have anything sort of in this vein where like extraterritoriality is explicitly a component of it, which is kind of like the, uh, that's probably like the, as I also talk in my, uh, my trend lines, this is like the biggest interesting trend is that countries are increasingly saying, you know, our privacy laws apply everywhere. And as you know, I think people could pretty, uh, obviously figure out um, if everyone says their laws apply everywhere, then a lot of problems are gonna start happening very quickly. All right, so we'll just getting, I'll just go quickly through my sort of, my big thoughts. This was the most freewheeling. I wasn't totally sure what way I wanted to tackle this. Cause basically I'm trying to think just, you know, the big, you know, galaxy brained thoughts about what is happening in privacy law right now and kind of where is it going and uh, what are the things that people should maybe care about? And I mean, so the first thing that just immediately jumps off the page, you have to kind of address the role that extraterritoriality is, it is a trend and it is probably going to be a problem to the extent, I mean, if it isn't already. And so, as I mentioned, this is countries saying that their laws apply outside of the territorial bounds of their country. This is one of those things that I, I often say people take totally for granted. It, it seems totally intuitive, but you know, the laws that you are subject to are based on the land that you're standing on. You know, so I am in Indiana right now. Indiana law applies. Indiana's in the US, so US law applies. If another country, you know, if Canada tried to say, no, you have to do X, Y, or Z, we would say, you know, say, you know no, you know, or make me, or, you know, there's, there's a lot of responses to that, but you'd basically say, Canada can't just regulate me without a good reason. And um, there's a whole, there's a whole history of sort of how the laws progressed as basically people in uh, other states, you know, people who are not in the same territory as you can still have impacts on you. And uh, because of that, we increasingly want people to be able to regulate bad behavior that has impacts on you wherever that is happening. And since we live in a, you know, a global economy where anyone can kind of have impacts anywhere, it explodes this whole problem so that theoretically, like anyone can regulate anyone anywhere else. And that's, that's really challenging. And so um, when you look at it kind of like from the legal perspective, you would say uh, potential for conflicts of law are significant, which just means that there are two laws that I'm subject to that disagree, right? One says you can't collect data on X. And the other one says you have to collect data on X, you know, you're in a tough spot, you know, no matter what you do, you're going to make someone angry. And um, there's also, I mentioned uh, below here, the potential for kind of incumbency effects, which is that as we get these really big laws where anyone who's trying to do business has to comply with, you know, a dozen or maybe even, you know, a hundred laws, you know, maybe if we get that to that level, and if you're like a new company, like having to comply with 100 laws is a deal breaker, right? And so it ends up creating a situation where only these really big companies who already exist, who are kind of like the motivation for these laws in the first place, they're the only ones who can actually comply with them. Um, and I, again, I'll mention because I'm, I'm almost out of time here. So if anyone has questions they want to throw out, even if it's not on this, I'm, I'm totally open to them. Otherwise, I'll just try and plow through my last few big thoughts. Uh, so I mentioned uh, number two, 
there is, there's a sense, at least to me, that there is increased pressure on the U.S. as a whole, not just like California, to adopt some sort of general purpose privacy laws, right? Historically, the U.S. has taken a data-specific approach where we say, all right, all right, you can have privacy rights about credit reporting, or you can have privacy rights about, um, you know, personal health data, you know, with HIPAA. But there's no across the board, doesn't matter what kind of data it is type law. And that's what GDPR does. That's what, you know, the Brazilian law does. That's what a lot of these laws are doing is just saying, no, there's a certain baseline set of behavior you have to, uh, you have to engage in when just processing any kind of data. And so there's pressure on the U.S., I think, to probably adopt something like that. Even if it's just to say, you know, California is not the regulator of the whole country, you know, the federal government is, federal government should take some sort of action on that. It's unclear if this will actually happen, but I, I mean, the pressure, I think, is definitely there. And this would also create at least the possibility for a sort of EU reciprocity agreement that could significantly simplify uh, the landscape for people who currently are worried about European laws when we really, it's like, I shouldn't have to worry about European laws because I'm not in Europe, right? If I had a European branch, then my European branch could worry about them, but I should really only have to worry about the laws in my own country. And there have been um, examples of this in the past. So prior to GDPR, there was this, you know, there was the data protection directive and there were problems where the U.S. didn't really, you know, there were, there were problems where the data protection directive uh, didn't want to send data to the U.S. And that was a big problem for all of our big tech companies. Uh, so we created um, this thing originally called the safe harbor, which basically said there are companies who can self-certify a certain level of privacy protection and then it makes them okay to send data to. And so that was like a workaround where the privacy people weren't really happy because it was a lesser standard than what Europe was imposing, but it kind of, it made life simpler, right? So people in the EU, I mean, people in the US could keep doing business. That has been uh, replaced with the privacy shield, which is slightly different, but does the same idea where um, we, we create an avenue for people to, um, for people, you know, these disparate laws to kind of interact in a way that makes more sense. Um, all right, and I'll just, yeah, I'm basically out of time, so I'm just gonna go very quickly through these last uh, two points. Uh, Scott? Yes, sorry, I accidentally <laughs> muted you when I, meant to unmute myself. Uh, we can go over if you've got time because we're recording this. So even people could just, you know, pick it up later. Okay. So keep going. Uh, I, this is my last slide. I was okay. just, yeah. I, when I see the clock just ticking away, I got a little <laughs> nervous. Okay. So uh, last two points and, uh, and then I'll open it up for any last minute questions. Um, the, yeah, this, so this third point is um, the, basically the role that large economies are having uh, by using their market for these sort of, uh, geopolitical is maybe not the right word, but economies are increasingly using access to their market to, uh, to enact change, you know, sort of like policy changes outside of their borders. And I mean, I note here, that this has always been a thing, right? People have always kind of used um, economic power as a way of projecting values or other things like that. Um, and so, the, the two points I kind of want to point out here are, um, one, we often don't notice it as much because the EU is close enough to the US that there's often a, a non-trivial portion of the US who um, agree with what they're trying to do, right? People have different opinions on privacy and some people are more privacy protective and they're more skeptical of what companies do with their data, whereas others are more you know permissive and they're kind of like, well, I'll wait until something bad really happens to me, right? If people are just doing processing and whatnot, they're collecting data on me, but it doesn't actually have a concrete impact on my life, I just don't care that much. And um, that's just a, a divide we see when people think about privacy. And so the EU is in some ways exporting their views of privacy uh, via these multinational corporations that kind of like are the, the vectors by which we all kind of interact with the world. And they're saying, well, we can regulate, you know, we can't regulate uh, U.S. people and tell people what to think, but we can regulate their companies because those companies are going to want to have access to our market. And because of that, we can 
sort of uh, subtly influence people's behavior. And so in the EU, I call this kind of a moderate example because there's, a, you know, again, a non-trivial number of people who agree with what they're doing, and so they don't see it as um, pernicious. The more extreme examples we'll often see coming out of places like China. And so uh, the two big examples that have come recently, uh, people who follow the news may have seen this. One has been, uh, there was some uh, kerfuffle with the NBA, where I think it was like an NBA manager or coach or someone uh, made a comment saying that they supported uh, Hong, Hong Kong protests that were happening. And uh, the Chinese government uh, was not happy about this. And so there was a sense that the NBA was uh, based, and so the NBA took action against that uh, coach or manager. I don't know all the details, but you get the general idea. And there was a sense that the NBA was kind of like uh, kowtowing to uh, China's interests and in doing so was suppressing speech. And this was not met well in the US. You know, we were not happy about this. There was another high profile example in my world because I like the video game Hearthstone. And it turns out that um, an esports player uh, who won like a Hearthstone tournament. You know, this was someone I'd never heard of before. Uh, but they, you know, after winning, they made a comment. So they, you know, they like put on a, a mask and showed solidarity with Hong Kong. And um, the company, you know, Blizzard, which is a video game company based in the U.S., uh, you know, they, uh, they took down the video and they stripped the person of their winnings and, uh, you know, they banned them. And they, they took all this action that... Um, was seen by people in the U.S. as censoring of free speech, and the sense was that you know they were doing it because of China, and that you know these companies are concerned about market access, and because they're concerned about market access, they are, uh, you know, they're they're uh, restrict you know they're restricting sort of values that we have, because um, they're trying to appease you know these you know countries with different values, and so I, I just note this as this is like a a trend that's becoming more and more. Um, notable, mostly because um, so much of our lives are through these web-based platforms that are multinational corporations that are basically trying to expand as far as possible. And the more they expand, the more those markets are trying to sort of like, you know, flex their influence on them. And, uh, and I, I know here just at the bottom that smaller organizations are kind of caught in the crossfire of all this, right? As you know, the EU is trying to regulate the Googles and the Amazons and the Facebooks. Uh, a lot of us, you know, just, you know, like more like the universities, you know, not small, but smaller are, you know, just kind of like stuck dealing with like, wait, what do I do with all these, you know, new laws that are popping up? And um, I think with that, that's a good place to stop. I've got more slides, but I don't need to go through them. So I'll, I'm happy to take any uh, last minute questions. Otherwise, uh, thank you all for listening and for uh, staying a little bit longer. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this presentation. Um, we've got a little bit of uh, business to, uh, related with uh, Trusted CI that I'd like to go through. So if you wouldn't mind uh, advancing the, 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 uh, the slide deck. First, please take our survey. Let us know, I'm gonna put it here in the chat so that you can click on the link. Uh, let us know what you think about the presentation and please use the comment section to give us uh, any suggestions about future topics that you would like to hear about. Uh, also, we just had our um, cybersecurity summit that just ended um, um, October uh, 17th. And we have presentations available on our website if you uh, weren't able to attend the summit, or if you were and you still would like to look at some of the presentations, please go to trustedci.org slash 2019-presentations. And the next um, item of business is that the fellows applications are open and due January 17th, 2020. Um, the fellows program is a new program that was launched last year. And it is the purpose of it is to bring uh, research scientists together to highlight uh, their cybersecurity needs. Von Welch and Data Brunson will be presenting a webinar on the application process December 19th. More details about that will be coming soon. Uh, if you want to learn more about the project or to apply, go to trustedci.org slash fellows slash apply. And the next item is, I believe, yes, our next webinar. So because the holiday season has a lot of travel, we skipped the November webinar 
and have the December webinar a little earlier in the month so that we avoid uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. So our next webinar is December 9th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, the topic is distributed, um, pardon, uh, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> distributed denial of service, excuse me, defense in depth for DNS uh, project. And the speaker is John Heidemann and colleagues. And I think with that, I want to thank everyone again for attending. It looks like um, a, a couple of people have commented, Scott, that it's been a great talk and it, it included really helpful information. So I just wanted to thank you again for presenting. And if you had any other last minute comments. Uh, no, I think that's a good place to uh, leave it. Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody for attending uh, and have a great day.